Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art and Talk. Art and Talk is an online interviewing platform for artists to share their art, background, inspiration, and passion. We embrace all the arts, the traditional arts, and the spiritual arts to bring you quality and diverse interviews so that you can be inspired by. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk, and we're grateful that you're watching today. Today, we're continuing with our series of presenting a collection of artists, all professional artists from the Palm Beach County area that are in the biennial exhibit at the Cultural Council in Lake Worth, Florida. So today is our final artist from this series, and we hope you've been enjoying this series. We've been bringing you a wide variety of artists working in a variety of, of different media. And if you haven't had a chance to catch the other videos from these artists from the biennial, you can jump onto our YouTube channel and just look for the playlist that says Art and Biennial, and you'll be able to see the full collection of artist videos there. So today we're going to be looking at another professional artist who is a painter, and we're going to be exploring some of her protest paintings. And we're also going to be looking at a book that she illustrated and wrote as well and find out all about her art and her artistic journey. So thank you again, everybody, for watching. And I'd like to welcome our guest artist for today, Maxine Schreiber. Hi, Maxine, welcome. Hi, Leslie Sue. I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you for asking me. Oh, absolutely. You are welcome. We are excited to have you here and to find out about your art and your artistic journey. So um, before we look into some of your, your art, Maxine, um, I know you're from a family of, of artists. I know your father was a, a pastel um, artist. So uh, tell us what that was like growing up and some of your influences and, and how you kind of started in the, this whole artistic journey. Okay, well, actually, Art has been a major part of my background from the time I was very young. Uh, thinking about talking to you today, it brought me to look at a book again that my dad shared with me. I, I could have been four years old, but it was called World's Greatest Paintings. Beautiful book, real big, thick book. Mm -hmm. And um, I now, unfortunately, my dad is deceased. I now have that book on my own bookshelf in this room, but he would share the, the paintings with me. He taught me how to draw when I was very young. He would show how you should draw a face that you could figure out where the eyes would be halfway from here to there and where you'd put a nose. And it was really um, something I just took for granted, but I don't think most people grow up little tiny children having their dads teach them how to draw and paint. And unfortunately, he was not able to earn a living as an artist. So it was something he did on the side while he did many other things. He was very much a Renaissance man. So he also played the trumpet and he did that professionally and wrote music, but mostly he was a salesman and he couldn't wait until he could retire so that he could just work on his art. And I grew up feeling similarly that art would be a passion but I'd never be able to earn money that way. And uh, when I wanted to go to commercial art school, he wouldn't pay for it, only fine art. So I, he said, no commercial school, fine art is it. So that's what I ended up studying. And since I didn't expect to be able to make a living as a painter, I ended up doing art education. And then I discovered I didn't like teaching. <laughs> So I went for a master's degree and that was in expressive therapies from Leslie University. And I, are you familiar with expressive therapies at all? Uh, can you define that for us? Sure, it's art therapy, dance therapy and psychodrama, which were mostly used not so much now, but, or at least, I don't know, because I've been retired for years, but back in the day in hospital settings, inpatient psych units, there was a lot of the expressive therapies 
that were used with people. And so that's what I ended up studying, but I ended up being a very traditional therapist, in fact, and not using the arts so much. Um, when I first moved to Cambridge, where I went for my master's, I thought that I was going to make it as an artist, and I literally was a starving one. Uh, I joined the Cambridge Art Association, but I just couldn't earn enough money selling paintings. So that's when I went for my master's. And once I became a therapist, I didn't paint for many years, something like 20 years. And uh, it wasn't until I had moved to Florida and had a private practice that in 2001, strangely enough, right before the Twin Towers happened, I found this need, I had to paint again. And uh, the artist in me was like really crying out to paint. So I started painting again. And by 2003, I don't know, are you a Floridian yourself, Leslie Sue? Yes. So you lived through uh, Francis and Jean and Wilma. That there was that year and a half period around two, I think it was 2003, 2004, where we had these hurricanes, three major hurricanes in a year and a half. And when, I believe it was when Wilma happened, I was, it was hard to get to work. And I canceled clients because the traffic lights weren't even working. And um, I had no plans of going to my office until at least we could drive. And I got a call from a woman I was supervising, my supervisee, who said she heard the roof caved in on her building. And I thought, I better get down there because I need to save my files can't let them be blowing out there. I was a psychotherapist. And driving down there, I was thinking, if the roof caved in, I think this is it for me. I'm, I had been painting at that point for three years. And I would see clients between one and eight in the evening and paint all morning. Mm. And at the point when the hurricanes happened, it was starting to feel like my clients were an intrusion. I felt terrible. I had loved my work, but now I just wanted to stay home and paint. So driving down to see this crashed in roof, I thought I'm not gonna refurnish and store it all over again. If this is it, I'm just gonna be a painter full time. And I got down to my office and the roof looked okay. And I went to open the door of my office and it was stuck from hurricane makes like the uh, doors stick. And I shoved it open and my office was perfect. And instead of feeling relieved, my heart was broken. <laughs> I came home sobbing and decided it's time. So I closed my practice and that was uh, two, it took me six months because I had to terminate with clients, but in 2005 was when I started painting full-time professionally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow, what an interesting story, Maxine, from, you know, from with your dad at four years old and all the different, you know, twists and turns and, and moving into art and then a little bit out of art and then, and then coming back and and um and whatnot so then you you heard that calling and then you and then you answered it it was just like it was it was just no turning back you just had to move on that path yeah and fortunately I was always very good at saving money so there was money there but I figured I was always good at earning a living now I want to be an artist of course I'm going to earn a living now I didn't realize how hard it is in the art world so had I known I wouldn't have done it so I'm glad I didn't know mm -hmm. <laughs> I was naive Maxine you do a lot of a landscape of Floridian landscapes and they're, they're just absolutely beautiful we're not going to be looking at any of those uh today uh, per se but you know um we'll be including your website so anybody can jump on there and look at them and they're just lush and and, and beautiful and, and fertile and and really um, displaying the, the Floridian landscape. 
Can you just touch upon a, a little bit of that? Because I know that's, that's a main love of yours. Yes, actually, that was my first love. I never, ever painted people. People just, I love people. I had done therapy with people. But now what I found when I started painting again in two, that, well, 2002, I start, or one, yes, it was 2001. And what I started painting were the landscapes. And what I discovered was that when I was painting, I was in the scene. So I, I take tons of photographs wherever I go, I take photographs. And then I, so I'm a studio painter, not a plein air. But I, when I would paint a particular landscape that I had photographed and liked, mm -hmm. I would find myself in that landscape. So if I was painting for six hours, for six hours, there I was in grassy waters or Wakota Hatchie or, um, a landscape in Maine, wherever I was painting, that's where I could be. And it was very, I felt like a monk for when I closed my practice and was just painting full time, I felt like I was in a Buddhist monastery because I spent so many hours in this very, for me, serene state. Mm -hmm. So the process for me has been very beautiful. And I, when I had to write an art statement, I would say things like, I see beauty everywhere and I try to recreate it with oil paint on canvas. And that's where I was at at the time, right before I started painting the protest paintings. I was very much loving painting landscapes. And then there was a presidential election and I was horrified, to be honest. Uh, I just, uh, growing up, I grew up in New Jersey, and Donald Trump did not have a good reputation in the metropolitan area. Um, he was known for being bankrupt six times, and each time he was bankrupt, contractors went without getting paid, and his father would come in and save him. And so I always saw him as some kind of con artist, and this was who was going to be president. So I know that in the recent election, 70 million people voted for him. So not everyone agrees with where I'm at. But all I know is that I was horrified. And I felt like I was living through a nightmare or some kind of horror sci-fi. And at the time, I just couldn't paint. That inspiration to paint beauty, it felt um, ludicrous. It was like the world is falling apart and I'm gonna paint pretty pictures. It just wasn't working for me. Uh, so for a couple of months, I didn't paint, but since Donald Trump lives in Mar-a-Lago, which is just, I live in West Palm Beach. So it's just across the intercoastal. People were protesting here before the inauguration. Uh, Trump Tower is down on Flagler Drive and for several weeks in a row, pre-inauguration, we were out there already standing with impeachment signs and carrying on. And as those events happened, and then once he was inaugurated, there was the Women's March. And that was a major event in downtown West Palm. Thousands of women showed up. It was a very joyful event, actually. And at all of these protests, I would take photographs. So I had all these photographs of people, people who I never painted, um, <laughs> but I kept seeing them. And, and, and instead of painting beautiful trees and water, here I was painting all these people holding signs and not painting at all. One morning I woke up and I don't know if it was a dream or it was, how sometimes when you first wake up, you have images in your mind. But I saw a painting of, of women marching, not just women, there were men, but mostly women marching, holding signs. And I saw it as a painting. And I thought, what have I got to lose? I don't have a boss. Nobody's telling me what I can or cannot paint. Why don't I try it? So I, I painted the first protest painting of the Women's March. And then for two years, that's all I was able to do was paint one protest after another. Um, but 
it got me through a very difficult time. Uh, and I learned a lot during that period doing the protest painting. I, was, I discovered that I was an activist in my 70s. I had been an activist back during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I had marched was marching against the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And now with Trump, I had thought, didn't I do all of that a million years ago? Do I have to keep protesting? But something inside said, yeah. You know, and I was like, where are the young people? <laughs> Why am I out there? But I did. And so there was the Muslim ban. And then there was a science march one weekend and a climate march the next weekend. There were maybe half a dozen marches to Mar-a-Lago. Whenever something would happen that would disturb us, we would march there. And I kept taking photographs. And along the way, I also had developed what I called collage style paintings. Other people called them montages. But what I would do is sometimes find, and it was at my landscapes before I even started doing the protest paintings, I would find that there was a place that I'd gone to that I loved so much and had so many photographs of that I couldn't, one photograph, one painting wouldn't do it. I would paint many experiences into one painting. And so one of the protest paintings that did get into the biennial show is called The Oceans Are Rising and So Are We. And that was one of my collage style paintings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and take a look at that while we're on the, the whole protest theme. And let's have you elaborate on this. Give me sure. just a second and I'll pull this up. Okay. All right. So um, you can see greetings from Mar-a-Lago and that's Donald Trump floating. It's greetings from Mar-a-Lago 2050. And in fact, two young people Actually, there was a third in the front carried this banner to, and I think that was during the climate march. As you can see, it's uh, the water rising above Mar-a-Lago in 2050. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but in this uh, clutch in the front, there's a young woman holding the baby and they have their pussy hats on and that was from the woman's march. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of people in this painting that I know in real life, know and love, and went to the marches with me. And though I'm not really good at painting people, they're more, as you can see, kind of cartoonish characters. Uh, people who know the people in the paintings know them immediately. <laughs> so I did get a likeness, even though they're not traditional uh, figures. But my cousin Jeff is in there holding We Can End Gun Violence, and that was more from um, the March for Our Lives. And um, there's an immigrant one. Uh, my friend Lupe is holding Approve, Not Repeal, the ACA. So a lot of what was going on in my life would get into the paintings. Mm -hmm. Um, recently, however, when, when it was in the biennial show, there was a reporter, and I don't remember which paper, who wrote, Maxine Schreiber lovingly immortalized the protesters of the past four years. And I thought, wow, that journalist got me. And it, I, it felt wonderful to think of them. But I guess that's what I was doing, that I felt like rather than just be an activist going to marches, that I wanted to have other people see them and for them to be there for years to come. That we were concerned about the climate and about healthcare and um, about the end of gun violence and all the other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're covering all these different these different areas, <clears throat> politically, um, societal, and environmental, and really, <clears throat> excuse me, being a voice for them artistically. That's what I hope. And one of the things I learned actually during this period, mm -hmm. a, a woman 
who I hadn't seen in, oh God, 50 years. We actually went to elementary school together, is an activist and also an artist. And she wrote to me and said, wow, a fellow artivist. And I had never heard that expression before. Um, and, but so I looked it up and it was like, I am an artivist. <laughs> I loved it. And an artivist is someone who uses their art to make, to share strong messages, usually political or societal or sometimes spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I thought, great, I'll be an artivist. So that was that. And um, the other painting that got into the biennial. Actually, I'd like to share a little bit about that, the Cultural Council. Mm -hmm. I, I was very honored this past year when COVID happened. I was one of the people that the Cultural Council chose to give a small grant to as part of the COVID relief fund to artists. And when that happened, I received a call telling me I would be receiving this grant. Mm -hmm. I believe it was Jennifer Rosen, who's uh, one of the curators there. She called and she said that she looked at my website and she saw that I had written a book, uh, done a children's picture book, and that she was planning an uh, illustrator's exhibit in the spring. And she wondered if what I'd want to take part. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'd love to. And that was that. And she said, I'll get, that was like last spring. So she said, when we get closer, like next winter, I'll get back in touch and we'll go about getting ready for that show. In the meantime, there was a call for the biennial show. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to be in the illustrator show, but I thought, well, that's just the story of Daphne the Duck. And that's not other work that I've done. Let me try, I probably won't get in anyway, but I'll, I'll submit. So I did submit and I actually submitted my landscapes because for two years, so that was all of 2017, all of 2018 and to part of 2019, I was just doing political protest paintings mm -hmm. and collages. Um, but I, I don't know if I got tired or it just, it was too much, but I needed to get back to my landscapes. And especially during COVID, I found being stuck indoors so much and being isolated that it gave me great pleasure again, painting the outdoors. So when I applied for the biennial show, I applied with JPEGs of three new landscapes I had done, um, landscapes of grassy waters. And when I got my acceptance, I assumed it was with those JPEGs that I applied with. But um, when I, 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 then I called to say, which JPEGs do you need? Because you were able to submit with three paintings and or three objects of art and I said did one get in did two did all three which ones do you want and um I was told just hold on this we're not sure and then it took I guess maybe even a month later I heard from Aldeida Delgado who was the curator for the show she's a, a, a fine art photographer from Miami and she, she was very serious in cu curating the show and the people that she picked. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really loved your work. And you had to write a statement with it. And I wrote a statement about the environment and how special it is to me and how concerned I am that we take better care of the environment and recognize the role that we play in climate change. And so she said, I, I really love that work. I thought it was really good, but I don't think it's gonna fit into this show. What I'd like in this show, if it's okay with you, I looked at your website and I saw that you have a series, this is what democracy looks like. And I would like something from that series if that's all right with you. And I was like thrilled, <laughs> I was like, yay, because 
I'm in several art groups and during the time that I was painting these paintings, they made it clear, do not submit. It was like, no. Um, some of them still won't allow nudes. In, in 2021, nudes sometimes don't get into the art shows. And I was told no political work. Mm -hmm. And that's all I was had worked on for like over two years. So mm -hmm. I couldn't even enter shows. And uh, so to hear that that's the work she wanted, these paintings were only shown in one gallery. In fact, in, in Lake Worth, Joyce Brown, who's a political activist and the manager of Clay Glass Metal Stone, invited me to show my series in the summer of 2017 and 2018. But then they were put away in a closet, not to be seen again. And so I was thrilled that that's what Aldita wanted. And so this got into the show. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and the next one. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll go to that one, Maxie. Okay. Yeah, here we go. This one, uh, it's BLM rally. Black Lives Matter is almost more relevant now than it was when I painted it over three years ago. And at the time, this was a rally that I went to down in Lake Worth, where the Cultural Council is. And it was in there right by their, I think it's the city hall, right? Like to the left. And they have this little plaza. And that's where we all met. And um, what I loved at the rallies, again, I, people are not my thing. You can see some of my interest in landscape and the banyan tree behind. And this one I put myself in. So that's my self-portrait. I'm the person, in fact, well, it's not the same top, but similar. Um, I'm the one holding the white silence equals white consent sign. Mm -hmm. um, I love the signs that people made. And when I was painting the painting, what was really important to me was being able to get small enough brushes or get my brushes to be able to put all the names in on like the sign, the Black Lives Matter all the way to the right. Um, the, the painting that's being held above the little boy. I love that, that um, poster. I thought the poster was so artistic. She is a fist. So I would get into people's signs as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, and so this painting happened. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share. Was there anything else you wanted to mention about this I protest? Guess not, except that I'm, you know, glad they're getting seen again. I think that um, they're important for people to look at. Mm -hmm. And and I may paint like that again someday if the inspiration comes to me. Mm -hmm. Let me stop the screen share. Thank you for sharing those uh, protest paintings. And so they, they lasted a couple of years and, and you touched upon so many issues, you know, as, as we had mentioned and that you've elaborated on, you know, whether it's democracy or or women's issues, racism, political, societal, the, the environment. And um, so let's just touch a little bit more. Um, what has the response been uh, for the, um, with the biennial and from other people that, that you've gotten from this? Um, well, actually there was a response even before then. I, people asked me to make posters because not everybody can afford a painting. Although I sold more of my protest paintings than most paintings that I paint. Like a lot went when they were at clay, glass, metal, stone. And it was interesting, uh, a city commissioner bought one, um, uh, a woman who was president of the National Organization of WOW, uh, now local chapter. So mm -hmm. political types liked my political paintings and mm -hmm. the poster sold quite a bit. I mean, all of my relatives, <laughs> I was constantly sending out posters. So that was great that people did want them. And um, the biennial, not much. I mean, um, I hear from people who say, 
I, I went to the Cultural Council and saw your work, congratulations, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, personally, you know, what did this do for you, Maxine? Now, um, obviously, as you've been elaborating, you were at these uh, marches, you were at the protests, and, you know, you became involved and you were photographing and then, you know, you were coming into your studio and, and um, being an artistic voice, and, as we've been saying, and, and representing these through paintings and, and you mentioned collages. So um, how, how did this whole process, um, these issues, you know, that you feel very strongly about and that you want to send a message about that you want people to, you know, um, look at and, and to be aware of and, and to take into consideration and to kind of look at this, you know, from a, a broad perspective on a personal level, um, how, how were you impacted by, you know, dealing with this, the, these, all these issues um, as a painter? I think that the painting saved me, to be honest. I mean, saved my mood. That if, if not for the painting, I think I would have felt very depressed or, or frightened. And I still do. I feel depressed and scared at times because I, our country is divided. Um, people still are denying climate change. There's still this thing, the lie about the vote. Um, I'm very glad, to be honest, that Biden won. I worked hard for Biden to get elected, mm -hmm. and I'm still active. Um, when all the marching happened in the spring and summer for Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. if not for COVID, I would have been out there marching. Mm -hmm. And my friends and relatives were happy <laughs> that I did not go out there that I said, no, I'm, I'm at an age that's at risk. It's ridiculous to put myself out there even with a mask on. So I didn't march, but I was like very happy that people were marching. And um, I felt like if Trump had won again, I would have been out there marching because I wouldn't have cared anymore. Um, you know, and, and people would say, don't talk that way. <laughs> But, uh, and I'm very alarmed that DeSantis just made this uh, law that may make it difficult for people to protest. Not may, will, because people can be arrested now. Or if somebody drives into a crowd, the driver of the vehicle will get off. The person that's marching, who could have been me? So... They're going to be threatened by women in their 70s who are holding a sign that says, please save our democracy. And, and that's going to be okay. So I'm still, I'm still very politically aware and concerned. But I think that having the art and also during COVID, being able to paint landscapes again has kept me someone who can act and who is inspired rather than somebody who feels defeated and overwhelmed and depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's interesting because the, the art has served you um, as a, almost like a, a healing mechanism to kind of process and deal with all these, you know, fear, worry, concern, all these different emotions, you know, that you were going through, that you were experiencing um, through painting them, you know, kind of coming to terms with them and, and, and whatnot was, you know, had a, a very strong um, healing uh, energy and, and, and quality uh, for you. As you said, you know, you felt like they saved you. That, that's, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah. And during COVID too. COVID, I know, has been a very difficult time for many people. And I have friends that are single and we're stuck, you know, in, in apartments in New York or up in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never felt that. And I, I feel I, I'm very blessed in that way that I felt it was just a period of time that I had permission to be creative. I could be a monk all the time and nobody was saying, come on, come out to dinner or go to the movies. Uh, which I do anyway. I'm, I'm very uh, active and social, but I didn't, I, it was like, um, how can I say, almost like a blessing 
to be able to just stay home and do my work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. had permission to do it. Mm -hmm. So for, so COVID has really kind of brought you back into that, that space of, of landscape and, and that whole nature and the serenity and the lush colors and the greens and tropical yeah. environment of, of the floor, South Florida area. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, before we move on into uh, your book um, and it, that has your illustrations and that you've written, um, the, let's just kind of close out on, on the whole protest paintings. I want to make sure that we've covered everything you wanted to say. And it also sounds like this series thus far has, has, has temporarily or you know, possibly kind of ended as of now as you've kind of moved back in, into your landscape painting. Yeah, I, I, I believe, I, I don't know. <laughs> I just finished a series of uh, Blue Cypress Lake, which is up in Vero Beach. And I found all of a sudden out of the blue, I needed to paint Blue Cypress again. So I finished two and have um, like did, was ready to do an underpainting for a third. And, and then with the whole biennial happening and knowing about this interview, I was feeling like, hmm, I wonder if I need to get back into the politics. And somebody at the biennial, one of the other artists said to me, I would love if you would do your landscapes, but have a political statement said in your landscapes, like um, doing an environment, but part of it would maybe be with an oil slick or something. And I thought, hmm, I've got to give that thought. So I don't know what might come out in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. upcoming future. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to get from you, Maxine, even though it, it's, you know, in some respects it's self-evident, you know, what you're saying in your protest paintings, but let's just hear it from you, you know, as the painter and, and someone, you know, who, you know, went to these marches and protests, experienced you know, all these different things and, and um, you know, what is, what is the underlying message, um, you know, central to the theme of this, this protest uh, series that you have? The theme is to look around, be aware. And we live in a world with diversity, accept each other. I guess the underlying message is just love love other people and love our our planet and take care of it and love art love beauty love what men can create men and women um what we as humans our creativity rather than our just destruction rather than hate and fear look at the beauty and people did say that to me at the bi biennial opening that um, even your Black Lives Matter, it doesn't look scary or threatening. People look joyful. And I said, the marches were joyful. We always had a good time. I, you know, we were just feeling so good to be out there together protesting, saying, hey, world, pay attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, great. That, that's such a great message. Thank you for sharing that. Let's go ahead and move on to your book on Daphne the Duck. Tell us what, what is Daphne the Duck and then we'll, we'll pull up a couple of images. The story of Daphne the Duck is actually a true story that has been slightly fictionalized mm -hmm. for children. Uh, so what happened was, oh gee, it's more like seven years ago now. Um, I have a huge pot out on my balcony and in the pot, it was filled with flowers, huge. I mean, it's really big pot and it was filled with pentas and wandering Jew. And I don't even know what else. At one point it had a hibiscus in the center. And one day my sister said to me, I saw an egg in the middle of the pot. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, come on. You're, you're, no, no, what she said is I saw a hole in the pot, like somebody's been in it, some kind of critter. We're on a fifth floor balcony, so it's not like any 
earth creature could get into it. So I, I looked and it didn't look like there was a hole in the pot, but I went that day uh, and got another penta and filled the hole. And the next day when I went out, that's when I saw the egg. So there was one egg in this pot, no bird, just an egg. And I went on Facebook and wrote, what kind of bird lays an egg and disappears? And somebody wrote back a duck. And I was like, a duck? What kind of duck? And then the next morning I got up like really, really early, like six o'clock in the morning and sat by that pot, but inside and looked and sure enough, a Muscovy duck landed in the pot and laid another egg. Mm -hmm. And she was there for, oh gosh, between laying the eggs and in the incubation, probably a good month and a half, like something like six weeks. She, would, she laid the 12 eggs. And when after the 12th egg was laid, she started to spend more and more time on the balcony. And I think it took 30 days for the eggs to finally incubate. Incubate, is that right? Mm -hmm. And um, then one morning, a Sunday morning, we looked out and there were all these adorable little ducklings. Well, one by one, they showed up and we watched them all day. And ducklings, unlike other birds, when I was little, we had actually my whole childhood, we had a robin's nest outside my bedroom window. And every year the robins would return. Mm -hmm. And those babies, when they were born, looked like, like little old men. <laughs> Their feathers wouldn't be in, they'd look well scrawny and took them weeks till they looked like birds. The ducks are born fully formed from the minute that they are born. They're adorable. They're so cute. They're like little Easter ducklings. Mm -hmm. So that's what they looked like. And before they were 24 hours old, the next morning, she was quacking and quacking and she ran off, like she went around the balcony and the little ducklings, each one jumped out of this pot, mm -hmm. followed her around the balcony. She put herself through the railing and flew off. And these little ducklings are jumping off. And I was screaming to my sister, Jen, Daphne's making the ducklings commit suicide. <laughs> I was terrified. But they, their latest feathers, they all survived. But meantime, me, I was out there with my camera taking pictures of all of this mm -hmm. and uh, followed Daphne, the ducks all landed. I took the elevator downstairs, ran around the building, followed them out to the pond, taking pictures the whole time. And I think it maybe was months later that I thought, I have to write a story about this, which I did. Mm -hmm. And that became the story of Daphne the duck. Wow, that's a great story. And you're a real observer, Maxine. You you observe nature, you know, with your landscapes, observe nature with the animals and observe people, you know, with the protests and, and with the marches, as well as, you know, in that aspect, being involved, you know, as well, kind of having both those, you know, hats to wear. Let's go ahead and look at this book on Daphne the duck and let's check this out. All right. Okay, so this is Daphne with her firstborn. And I actually sent you the page rather than the JPEG, because mm -hmm. what I did is I, I did, I think there's 40 paintings in the book. I did the paintings and then I ended up putting the writing in. Um, and so this is until the day she heard a loud, loud crack. So she was sitting on the eggs in the previous page and felt something move from her front to her back. The first one that hatched, all cuddly and small, popped out in front and stood very tall. And then, and this is Quickie. That's the first one. He was sleep at the other side of the page talks about him taking rest. So this is when he was actually resting again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the book came out in rhyme. <laughs> I've never written poetry, but it came out in rhyme. And I told the whole story that I just told you, but it's all in rhyme with watercolor pictures. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, 40 watercolor pictures and then the, the poetry and rhyme all centering on, on uh, Daphne, the duck and her, her uh, eggs and then the, the babies being born and that, that whole experience. Oh, and leaving her husband, Drake. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Drake couldn't fly that high, which is, we've had many ducks since then. And the male ducks never fly up. But recently we had a duck named Dottie. <laughs> Need to have this score. Someday there's going to be a series. But anyway, Dottie, her eggs never hatched. And she didn't leave. She was on those eggs for like three months. Mm -hmm. And her drake actually flew up and would sit on the balcony with her. I'm sure he was trying to coax her off the balcony, but she finally left. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but this Drake in this story didn't fly that high. So Daphne was eager to get back to Drake at the pond. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a great story. And I love how they all have names, in, including the, the, <laughs> yeah. the ducklings too, all got <laughs> names. Mm -hmm. It was fun. Yes, yes, beautiful. And we have one more to, to look at. Okay. Okay, and this is 12 eggs. Uh, this was one of the ones that Jennifer asked for. I had no idea why. There were other illustrations I liked more, but she liked the 12 eggs, so she got it. Mm -hmm. And in the illustrations, like at this point, there were few, the pentas were gone, but there were still the Wandering Jew. As the book goes on, you see how the pot gets emptier and emptier as her stay extends and the ducklings are born. So by the end, I don't think there were any flowers in the pot. Mm -hmm. Any significance with the number 12? That was the number of eggs she had. I see. Okay. But only six were hatched. That's part of the story. I see. So she, she would have liked to have a, a, uh, 12, but six was fine. That's mm -hmm. what she got. Mm -hmm. And what was the reasoning with doing the watercolors as opposed to um, oil paints for the Daphne the Duck story? Well, oils take a very long time to dry. And I thought it would take me forever. Whereas watercolors, which it took long enough doing 40 watercolors, but watercolors I could do in a couple of days and then they were done as compared to the watercolors each watercolor could have taken me at least a week, mm -hmm. maybe more, mm -hmm. uh, depending on all that was in the in the oils. So, uh, I, and it would be much more costly using oils, the canvases, the actual oil paints. Mm -hmm. So that's why the watercolor. And I never really, I shouldn't say never, I took a watercolor class several years ago while I, I was in a gallery up in Jupiter and one of the other artists was a fabulous watercolorist and he was teaching a watercolor class. So I took it and I never liked watercolor that much. It seemed much harder to me because you kind of have to get it right the first time. It's not like oils where you can change things and paint over. Watercolor, it doesn't really work that well. So I wasn't thrilled with watercolor but he taught me how to use them enough. And so at the time when this, I thought, again, it was one of those, I don't have a boss and what do I have to lose? I'll try my best. So that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully done. Maxine, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share. Okay. We still have a few more minutes left. Um, so I love everything that we've been covering and we, We've been looking at, um, well, first of all, you work in a variety of media because you, you work in oil, you work in watercolor, you also do a collage work as well. And I was looking on your website, you also have some hard edged paintings that are more uh, like buildings and, and physical structures uh, alongside with your landscapes as well. And um, so we've taken a, a look at some of your, um, your oil paintings and, um, and the uh, protest um, messages that you have. And then also just in, in your book um, with uh, Daphne the Duck with the watercolors and also that um, you wrote as well. With a few more minutes that we have, 
What have we not touched upon in your art, your artistic journey that you'd like to share? Oh, I'm not sure. But since we have extra time, why not? The other thing I do is write, and I've been writing novels for at least six years now. Haven't gotten published yet, except for Daphne, which I self-published. Mm -hmm. So so that's the other thing. Throughout the time that I've been painting, I've also been writing. So one of the books that I worked on at the same time that I was doing the protest paintings, I wrote a book, Rachel Klein's Diary, and it was the diary of a high school student in Dreyfus who was the painter of those paintings in the book. Because I thought if the book ever got published, I could put all the protest paintings in because they're Rachel's, they weren't mine. Um, and Rachel actually uh, became a really strong activist during March for Our Lives. So I was writing about March for Our Lives and painting. One of the uh, paintings that didn't get into the biennial is from March for Our Lives. Mm -hmm. So the writing and the painting go together. Um, at one point I was writing a book called Visions of a Blind Artist, which was kind of a fairy tale. And so a number of paintings I did at the time, one was called The Castle, uh, actually a couple of castles. One was the castle, another one was castle on the beach. So the writing and the painting go together. My fantasy is someday one of those books will get published mm -hmm. and it'll have the paintings in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Some of the paintings, the paintings that go with the castle or the paintings that go with Rachel's diary. So we'll see, who knows where there's yeah. like, there's hope. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, much success with all of the projects that you have going on and, and the fulfillment, you know, with, with the books. I, I hope that comes into fruition for you. Um, this has been wonderful. I appreciate you sharing your art and your artistic journey and, you know, what's important to you to express uh, as a visual artist. We do need to wrap the show up, Maxine, and we'd like to offer you the closing comments. And then if you could also let us know how we can stay connected with you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for interviewing me today. And if people are interested, they can see my work at schreiberstudio.com, uh, www.schreiberstudio.com, or I'm also on artistofpalmbeachcounty.org or women in the visual arts, so it's witfa.org, or palmbeachculture.com, that's the cultural center, on their uh, artist directory. So I'm in a lot of places, if anyone, and different pictures in the different places. And um, and I hope that you stay in touch. I would like to, I didn't know about you before this. So I would like to be able to watch your future interviews. So yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, welcome to, you know, join us on our Facebook page and then also on our YouTube channel. And yeah, absolutely. We appreciate you coming aboard as, as um, our guest artists. And yeah, absolutely. Please do stay connected with us and let us know what's going on with, with your, you know, different projects that you have going on. Great. I will. Thanks so much, Leslie. So. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you, everybody, for watching Art and Talk today. Again, we always appreciate your time that you take to watch our artist videos. This does conclude our presentation of bringing you a select group of artists from the biennial at the Art and uh, Cultural Council Center in Lake Worth, Florida. And the exhibit does run until May 28th. So if you're in the South Florida area local, or if you just happen to be traveling through, you definitely want to stop by and uh, check out the exhibit. And if you'd like to watch, as I mentioned earlier, the artists that we've interviewed, just jump on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to look at the playlist art and the biennial you'll be able to see the full spectrum of artists that we've interviewed thank you again maxine for being our guest artist today and we'll talk soon on the next art and talk until then be well and be blessed